Chapter 77 to 79 Interlude, Lena. I did not wish to attend a feast, not with all the questions still swirling about as to just who had tried to kill me. None of the obvious candidates made sense. I believe that Allison's plan had been to expose Laner and Joffrey, I believe that poison would never be a vector of death that Damon would ever stoop to and I can't believe Dorne would strike against the faction calling for peace with them before they struck at the man behind the scenes so to speak. Her Grace, Princess Renera of House Targaryen, called the steward. Accompanied by Ser Laner Valerion. We were shown to my father's side and he immediately turned to me and smiled, dropping his hand to my very, very large stomach. I clenched my jaw and bore it. It was not a habit he seemed keen on letting go anytime soon. Thankfully, the twins did not do their best to batter my insides in response and I fancied he looked just a tad disappointed at the fact. Just past his shoulder, Allison peered at me. She was pale and drawn, the makeup she wore doing little to hide the strain of the three weeks since Alice Strong had died. I gave her a nod in greeting that she returned, not hiding her surprise. I had made my decision though. I would have peace with her for now. I would focus on finding my potential poisoner and if she played nicely, I might even let her have a turn on the rack with him. Then I would deal with her petty, twisted, delusional self. Viserys smiled but it was strained. I still think he suspects her. After our little talk, I had gone to father and laid out what she had intended with the dinner and with her discovery of Joffrey and Laner. He had sulked about my husband once more but that sulkiness had been quickly driven away by his anger that she was unable to leave the whole matter alone. It helped that the three knights had backed up everything I had said. He only had Dayron left to hold over her head now and he had sworn that he would allow me to decide if and who Dayron would go to. Then he had told me he would give Alicent this information and make sure the point was finally rammed home. I was not convinced it would prevent her pettiness, Alicent was a mistress of it after all, but I did think the threat of losing her final child would stop any larger schemes. Regardless though, it was an advantage I could hold over head. A stick to the carrot of finding out who had set her up as the obvious candidate to a poisoning. It was only how badly they had fouled it up that had saved her from the consequences. After all, had she not been acquitted in Joffrey's eyes and mine, I would be pushing father for punishment right now. Had I succeeded she would have lost her head, not even father's love for his second wife would have protected her. Gods, the dance would be back on in truth then. In a twisted kind of way, I was thankful it was not Alicent. Aegon and Eamon would blame me, I was certain of that. The initial blame would only be reinforced by the lords that had been in her confidences, all of which would have known she was not responsible. They would paint it as a lie on my part, capitalizing on my own friend's death to murder their mother. To them I would be a heartless bitch who'd proved herself intent on killing them. Helena would be grief-stricken. She loved her mother and she loved me and the knowledge that one had died because of the other would kill her inside. It hurt to think she might have looked at me with hatred or seen me as a constant reminder of the loss of her mother. A prisoner in all but name and Eamon being shuffled off early was the only blow back so far. Aegon and Helena had not seen it but Eamon had to know. His goodbye had reminded me he was still a boy for all that he was angry and quick to violence. He had broken down into tears. He had begged his father not to make him leave. He had begged his mother not to send him away. He had even begged me to help him. He had wrapped his arms around Ser Thorn's leg and it had taken Ser Stefan and father working in tandem to remove him without hurting him. I felt like a monster. Putting aside my feelings of crippling guilt over Eamon, ruling out Alicent had left us with a dearth of suspects. It would be nice if I had the first clue as to where else we could look but I did not. Joffrey had even gone as far as to look into my more far-fetched fanon based suspects like the Maesters or Bravos and their faceless men. Certainly nothing on those fronts so far. We were stuck combing through every rumor and report for the one little hint, the one tiny overlooked clue, that could give us a breakthrough or something to aim at. How goes the day, Ser Valerion, asked Viserys with false cheer, as if trying to distract himself from his thoughts. Laner smiled warmly in response. Well enough, your grace. We have both been looking forward to Renera's name day feast for quite some time, he enthused and also lied through his teeth. Both of us had been dreading it. The poisoner was still out there for all father had ramped up security to a truly frightening level. Honestly, I half suspected he'd be setting up checkpoints next, searching the poor staff for suspicious objects. We made tense small talk for a while longer as the guests began to arrive. Then we were forced to sit through the endless line of lords who were eager to give their gifts, to be searched twice for anything suspicious and definitely no consumable goods dash, congratulate me on reaching 9 and 10 years before gratefully shuffling away from the suspicious glances they were all receiving. 
Even Alicent appeared to be studying the guests with an intensity I rarely saw from her. In a small window of peace, Laner leant over to me. I was unaware Alicent would be here, he murmured. I smiled as if he had just told me an amusing joke and leant over to whisper back. So was I but I believe she desires peace between us for now. She wants to know who left her to take the fall for this poisoning. She may even hold our cloaks as we put them to the rack, I told him and he nodded, eyes going serious. Joffrey has never believed it to be her. Did she so convince you with her words? You have not told me what she said. I thought about that. Before I had her confession from her Joffrey and I had disagreed on Alicent. He believed that she and her factor had been planning something far less, destructive than a brazen poisoning in the center of the keep. Yet I had argued her to be desperate, backed into a corner and willing to do anything as she was confronted with the prospect of becoming nothing more than her father's puppet and less than that should Aegon take the throne in a regency. He had been right, annoyingly. She had a different nasty plan in mind. Not nearly as fatal either, although had she pulled it off Joffrey and yourself would be a little chilly for a while. He nodded along, looking unsure. As weird as it sounds, I do believe her. And Otto, he whispered. She said nothing on that front. In fact, she did not mention him at all. At this point I would count them as two separate entities. Our only question is which way Joffrey's friend has gone. I dislike this, he groaned, a little too loudly and attracted Viserys' attention. He flushed at the raised eyebrow like a child caught doing something wrong. Is the food not to your liking, Ser Valerian? he asked in an icy voice. I apologize, your grace, he said. Those violet eyes remained on him for a little longer and then he turned away and began shoveling food into his mouth at a rate that made me feel quite nauseous. Or maybe that was the babes, who knew these days. I was so ready to give birth and have my little Eamon and Baylor or Valina and Alyssa out of me already. I never thought I'd say that, let me tell you. Something tells me your father still dislikes me, Laner mumbled, looking like a chastised boy. I grimaced at the plate. He believes I am forcing myself to be with you for the good of House Targaryen. He will realize in time. Probably right around the time the twins are born, I mumbled back. Almost as if they had sensed their mention, the twins began kicking and I winced. Calm your children before they bruise me. He placed his hands on my stomach and grinned like a complete dork when he felt them moving and kicking, even through the relatively thick velvet I was wearing. Then he frowned. Is this a new dress? He asked. It's different from your old ones. I glanced down in the black and red velvet, surprised he'd even noticed my change in style. Somewhat new. The old ones were not exactly accommodating to my pregnancy, and this style hid my figure much better. I wasn't going to try and show off what I did not have anymore, only grief lay down that road. Bemused, he took his hands off my stomach and began eating again, occasionally shooting me thoughtful glances. Surely my change in dresses does not disturb you so, I teased. It seems so odd now that I think about it. You always wore a particular style. There was a blush on his face and I stamped down on the urge to tease him further. It seems some of my passion about how someone should dress had gotten through, then. Do not worry yourself about it. I promise I bought my new wardrobe with my own money. He gave me a thin smile in response but our conversation had drawn the gaze of my father once more. I note Lady Rainey's and Lord Corley's are not present tonight, he said and managed to make it sound like an accusation, as if it were some sort of personal insult. They are seeing to an issue with the rebuilding of Spice Town, your grace, he told him. They sent their apologies to Renneret directly. Rainey's had wanted to stay here so that Malay's was an easy view of Alicent. My dear good mother did not believe her to be as innocent as I did and was just waiting for an excuse to have Malays make a meal of her, or burn the high tower with its occupants still in it as a message to anyone who would strike at her family. To be fair to Corlys as well, he had also wished to stay. He wanted blood just as much as Rainey's did yet he also wanted Spice Town rebuilt and this conflict was delaying everything. Since Vaymond had proved completely unable to deal with it, he'd been forced to ask his wife to take him home for a few days. How goes the rebuilding? asked Alicent. Father says it goes well. I have yet to visit, Lena replied. There was a pang of sadness in his voice and I slipped my hand into his. Once the babes are born it's only fair they should see Dragonstone and Driftmark. Which naturally had Viserry scowling at the thought I was going walkabouts once more. Well, he'd have to get used to it. Once the babes were old enough I was having my damn procession. I'd waited long enough. As he struggled with some sort of objection to that, I focused on Laner's smile at the thought. Spice Town and High Tide held a special place in his heart. 
one of my children, the potential bailer inside me now, would inherit it one day. He wanted to leave them a shining beacon of prosperity, not the sad and damp island his own father had once inherited. I wanted the same, in fairness. I wanted to leave my children a Westeros that was better than when I was given it. A better king's landing, a stronger monarchy, a kinder peoples, actual dragons instead of twisted and deformed monsters. Perhaps it was time to start thinking just exactly how I was supposed to do that. To finally make a plan for the future. A road map of what reforms I intended to bring in. Once Corlys and Rhaenys returned I would gather my little small council and we would decide together. Boohoo, I moaned as Laner's hands pressed into just the right spot. Yes, keep going. He chuckled and did as he was told, earning a happy sigh from me. Joffrey and Lena were together today doing only the gods knows what in their shared office. I had decided I'd done enough hobbling around lately and stayed in bed, only to be joined by Laner after his training. After one to many complaints about my feet aching, I'd managed to finagle a foot rub out of him and boy was it worth the whining. I let my eyes flicker closed as I groaned in happiness again. He snickered in response but I did not care, not as long as he kept this up. The muscles in my stomach fluttered, cramping briefly, as I relaxed. What exactly is Lena doing anyway? She came by and stole some of my notes, you know, he said after a while as his hands moved up to my swollen ankles. She's working on producing a compare, yes, just there, a comprehensive guide on dragons. He made a small noise of disbelief at that. The notes she stole were not on dragons, Laner told me. I opened my eyes and stared at the canopy of my bed before sighing. What were they on? I asked. Surely she hadn't gotten sidetracked already? Remember those books you borrowed from Melos? I nodded. Well, she wanted my notes on those. She's read them herself surely, I said, frowning. He nodded. What is she doing with notes about ETI? Did they mention dragons at all? No. Well a little, it was mostly about culture, really. A bit of history, some legends, there was a really interesting one on festivals. Father got to witness Dash, his fanboying was cut off by a disturbance in the hall. I must insist you do not Dash, came Sir Stefan's voice. His grace has summoned the princess to the Red Keep. She does not have a choice, barked Laurent Marbrand. It took quite a bit of effort to push myself up onto my elbows and peer over my stomach. Laner and I shared a puzzled glance before someone, probably Marbrand, pounded on the door. I let me head fall back onto the pillow as my stomach cramped again. Honestly, if I never had another cramp as long as I lived it would be too soon. Your grace. Laner clambered to his feet and unlatched the door, pulling it open as Laurent's fist came up to knock again. The Lord Commander paused at the scene before him, as if he had not been expecting it. Me sprawled on the bed and Laner half-dressed in training gear. On behalf of His Grace, King Viserys, I am to escort you to the Red Keep immediately, he said, recovering a moment later. In my nightgown? I asked, pulling myself into a sitting position. Laurent flushed. I will allow time for you both to dress and bathe, he finally said. Laner reached over and pulled the bell pull as worry wormed its way into my gut. Being marched to the Red Keep under guard implied I had done something wrong recently. A maid appeared in the doorway and was ordered to prepare two baths and to rouse Lady Sarah to help me dress and bathe. Then Laner, ignoring Laurent's judging eyes, helped me to stand. Any clue what this is about, he mumbled, as he made a show of keeping me steady. Not at all, I replied. He grimaced. What could Viserys know that would have him this angry? Gwaine's accident? That had been months ago, Joffrey had long since cleaned up evidence of that plot. It couldn't be about the poisoning because he was angry at me, not whoever had carried it out. Sarah appeared soon after, provoking the usual surge of guilt when I saw the pain spasm over her face at my swollen belly. Sir Stefan remained with me and Sir Laurent left to keep an eye on Laner as he prepared himself. What is happening? asked Sarah, when he disappeared. Is it regarding Alice? When a glance to Sir Stefan elicited a genuine shrug, I rubbed at my temples with a sigh and shook my head. I do not know. I doubt it is about Alice though. The king is angry. With me, specifically. He has sent guards enough for Sir Joffrey and Lady Lena too, Sir Stefan said after a moment's hesitation and my stomach plummeted down to somewhere by my knees. That Viserys had figured out enough to know Joffrey was more important than I let on was a given, to drag him along with Lena to the keep. Gods, had he figured out our arrangement? Was this to be a public humiliation? What could he do to me in that situation? Strip me of my title for sure. 
It was not against the law, per se, to have a lover of the same sex, but that would not save me. Not from Viserys or the court. I did not stay in the bath for long, worry and the occasional cramp or jolt of pain making the whole process less fun than usual. Still, it was enough to be clean. Sarah helped me dry and then dress myself before pulling my hair into my usual braid. Somehow, despite my haste, I managed to look halfway presentable as I met with Laner, Lena, and Joffrey under Laurent's steady gaze. Then all four of us were escorted into litters and the journey to the Red Keep began. I found myself tapping out a nervous beat on the lacquered wood as we traveled. If he stripped me of my title, exposed my affair with Lena and Joffrey's with Laner, Rainey's would go nuclear and he had no counter bar holding us hostage. No, I was certain now this wasn't about who slept in my bed. Not that Lena and I had slept together but you get the point. He wouldn't risk publicity for it. What had roused my father's anger then? What if some varying degrees of possibility taunted me until we reached the keep itself, then all thought was banished by a freezing dread that made my movements clumsy with fear. What had I done? Was this Joffrey's fault? I wanted to scream and demand someone tell me what I was in trouble for, what I was to be accused of. Yet my escort was silence as we were led not to the throne room but the small council chamber. The small council, or a small part of it, were arrayed before us. Otto, Corlys and Jeremy were all missing. Alicent was present, pale and grieving. I felt my stomach plummet again. Which one had been hurt? Aegon? Helena? Surely not Eamond but would he would still be on the road to Riverrun? I was not sure, excessive travel by dragon had spoiled me on travel times. I took a deep breath and steadied myself as Lena, Joffrey and Laner lined up next to me and we were stood before them all like naughty children receiving judgment for what we had done. I allowed myself to examine Viserys in the following silence. He was pale and furious, looking to be struggling with his words. Lionel stood next to him, his eyes impossible to decipher. Just looking at the hand made my heart ache so I allowed my gaze to travel on. Lyman was trembling in his seat, looking at me like I'd gravely disappointed him. Jasper looked afraid. That was my first thought when our eyes met. Angry and afraid. Melas was doing his best to keep out of my notice, to not catch my eye. Afraid also. What? The. Fuck. Father, you are EQ dash. Silence. My greeting was immediately halted as I flinched at the volume of his bellow. I swallowed again, fear turning my blood to ice now. I hadn't seen him this angry since my return from the Vale. An ache began in my fingers, my stomach clenched unpleasantly and my breath came a little short as the memories of that particular meeting rushed back. I trust you have heard the news, he said, finally. His voice was shaking with the effort of not screaming at us. News? At my baffled look, he raised a single silver eyebrow. Do not play games with me, Renera. The assassin referenced the greens in his attack, he barked. Confusion and fear made my breath come quickly. What fucking assassin? We'd called Otto's death off and yet. And yet he wasn't here was he? I'd assumed he was still under guard but if Alicent was here and grieving like that it was because someone close to her had died. Not her children, her father. Oh fuck. I. I truly do know Dash, Viserys cut me off again. Last night, he began slowly. Otto Hightower was permitted a walk in the gardens. Several men, disguised as servants, ambushed him. At the acknowledgement I'd been right in my guess, I swallowed hard again. Otto dead and I was the only real suspect. Just like Allison had been the only suspect for my attempted poisoning. Was someone trying to set us against one another? And these fucking cramps. Could I get a break for five fucking minutes? I needed to think and they would not let me. They slew his guards and then turned their blades on him. They specifically referenced his association with the Green Faction. They claimed to follow their queen, Viserys continued, heedless of my no doubt wide-eyed stare of fear. None of them were caught at the scene. The silence that followed was deep and terrible. I wanted to crane my head round, to look to Joffrey and just what the hell he was playing at. Some indication of whether this was some sort of sick joke. Had he gone ahead regardless? Well. Viserys demanded. I did not do this was my somewhat heated response. He glared at me. Do you expect me to believe this is not revenge? I swore I would find who was responsible for the poisoning. Yet you decide to ignore all of the evidence pointing elsewhere at strike at Otto, he bellowed. I did not think it was Otto. I believed Alicent when she said it wasn't her. 
I cast a desperate look at the queen. Her eyes were red-rimmed and she was staring at me in a way that took me by surprise. There was no hatred there, just weird mix of emotions. Grief, shock, anger and more. I will ask once, Viserys intoned, drawing my attention back to him. Are you behind Otto's murder? I am not, I said firmly. I had no reason to kill him. Every reason to want him alive. At least acknowledge if it was me I would not have my assassins announce who hired them to all and sundry. Perhaps that was not the best defense I could have mustered. It did, after all, imply I had assassins. You will all remain in the keep. You will be given separate rooms. You will submit to my guard. I will examine your communications. Renera, you will summon Lord and Lady Valerion back to court where they will agree to similar restrictions. I gaped at him. There was no way Rhaenys or Corlys would agree. Father Dash. No, my mouth snapped shut. I will not have this court turn into a bloodbath. I will not have you start a war in King's Landing. Husband, Alicent said in a soft voice. If you would still hear my counsel, I believe her. There was a surprised silence after that where both Melas and Jasper turned to gaze at her in surprise. Even Lionel looked momentarily startled. We normally only agreed when it came to Damon and even then it was tenuous alliance at best. Viserys placed a hand over hers and nodded. Be that as it may, you will still dash, the door was thrown open and several gold cloaks marched in, Harwin Strong at their head. His handsome face bore a fierce grin, one of triumph, despite the grim tidings he likely bought. Your grace, he said and dropped to one knee. Father. Rise, Ser Strong. Have you found the men who murdered Lord Otto? Harwin rose and nodded. We even left them alive for questioning. Lari says they sang like songbirds for him, Harwin told us. I frowned. He was too happy for that torture to have resulted in my name being spoken. And what did these murderers have to say? Asked Viserys, hands still resting on Alison's hand but his eyes were on my face. They described the man who hired them in great detail. Your grace, I recognize the man in question. He is a Dornish merchant who operates near the docks. Harwin told us all, breathlessly. Viserys rose to his feet, face red with rage. It makes sense, said Joffrey, voice soft. Then attention of the room swiveled to him and he straightened his shoulders. Viserys hasn't bought you here to hear you speak, I wanted to tell him, he bought you as a threat to me. The Dornish set the blacks and the greens fighting and we take our eyes from them. The man speaks sense, said Jasper. We must make war on the Dornish as soon as winter comes to an end. To avenge Alice Strong and Otto Hightower. Oh, do not worry Lord Wilde. The Dornish will have their reckoning. Viserys growl set chills down my spine, even as his distrusting eyes lingered on me. Do not worry, wife. We will teach them how they have erred here, Viserys assured the pale and tense Alicent as the rest of the counselors filtered away. We remained, still arrayed like naughty children until he gestured at the recently abandoned seats. We sat. I will require Valerion dragons, said Viserys. Laner nodded, seriously. His sister followed, less assured. Joffrey remained grim. He had no dragon to offer, no sword to swear, only his mind. Judging by his unhappy look, his mind was telling him war with Dorne was not the path we should be taking. Yet blaming the Dornish was the only thing we could do in this situation unless we wished to be blamed for it ourselves. You have Syrax as well, father, I said. He studied me for a moment and then shook his head. No, I will not. You will remain in the capital. I goggled at him before rage hit me like a hammer blow. Another cramp hit me but I was too angry at the thought of not going to let it show on my face. I will not be left behind. Much to my annoyance, I sounded more like a whining child than a queen. I will have given birth by the time the banners have mustered. I will be with you. No, said Viserys, his face grim. You will be here. You will have the babes to look after and I will need someone to be my voice in my absence. You would send those I love to Dorne. Dorne. I needed to draw back. I needed to be careful but fear pushed me on. I glared at Laner and his sister, willing them to say something to my father, to support my need to go. All I received were twin looks of concern from two sets of violet eyes. I felt helpless, if either of them died there. Gods, what would I do with myself? Laner's death would see me forced to marry once more. To who, I do not know. Tyland Lannister was yet to find a bride, there were a few Valerians free, Aegon was an eternal possibility. 
none of those options appealed to me, none failed to make my skin crawl at the thought. Lena's death. It would hurt me so deeply I doubted I could bring myself to find another. We were so early in our relationship and yet I knew that losing the only woman I'd managed to find that excited me would change me on a level I did not want. Just like losses of her loved ones had changed the original Renera. I would give you the capital. I would have you rule in my name. If the gods be good, the conquest will be over before long. It will not. I cried and Laner caught me gently, pulling me close. Aegon and Visanya failed, Rhaenys failed. The Dornish will unite against us and nothing, nothing, is too dishonorable for them. Then you have also argued for your exclusion from this, barked Viserys. I will not have you die to poison or an assassin. Be safe in the capital. Raise your babes. I will ensure your husband returns to you. Now, my wife is grieving and I must begin the process of Otto's funeral rites. He would be laid out for a viewing in the September for seven days and seven nights. Then he would be sent to the high tower to be interred alongside his family. After, Viserys would gather his lords. The prospect of war with Dorne would bring them to the capital in droves. The invasion would be discussed, planned and finalized in those days. Do not leave me out of this, I croaked through tears that threatened to fall. If I cannot go myself, let me attend the planning. Let me do something. Viserys paused in his efforts of helping Alicent rise and eyed me with pursed lips. Then finally he sighed. An extra set of dragon riding eyes will not harm discussions, he admitted. I expect Lady Lena and Ser Laner as well. And then we were dismissed. I was numb by the time we made it back to the manse. Numb mentally and emotionally, feeling like my brain was working at half speed. The accusation of Otto's murder had come out of nowhere and then been so easily disproved. War with Dorne was now a certainty and short of some sort of apocalypse, I had no way of stopping it. Those I love would be stripped from my side and I didn't know how long for or if they'd even come back to me. Was it truly the Dornish? Did they truly seek to set Alicent and I to war in order to distract Westeros as a whole from themselves? Surely they are not so foolhardy. The men hired to kill Otto had spilled their guts about who had hired them within seconds. All had told the same story. The merchant accused would soon be captured and brought to the keep to face Laris and his confessors. Then the truth would be known. I curled into Lena's side as she half carried me into the drawing room that was fast becoming a conference room of sorts. Gods, I was so tired. Everything was happening too much, too fast. I wanted sleep yet my mind would not stop whirling with possibilities. She was gentle as she hauled me along, mumbling reassuring nonsense as I tried to get my legs to cooperate with me. I was lowered down into the couch closest to the fire, needing comfort, I tucked her down next to me and laid my heavy head on her shoulder. She began unpicking my hasty braid, massaging my temples as my hair came loose. Was this how Allison had felt when she'd been accused? Lost and frustrated? I curled my hand around my stomach as the cramps picked up again, refusing to give me any rest from the reminder I was heavily pregnant. Joffrey was the last to enter the room and he promptly picked up a discarded book and hurled it at the wall with enough force the crack of the impact made me jump. Three sets of violet eyes turned to him in shock and horror as he remained still, eyes wide and breath coming fast. Then he screamed in frustration and anger, snatching up another book. I curled closer to Lena at the noise, flinching, remembering another scream of anger long ago. I grimaced at the accompanying pang of pain from my fingers. Laner caught his wrist before he could throw the book and pulled his lover close. What has gotten into you, murmured my husband. I heard the noise of frustration Joffrey let out. He was a Stormlander. A proud martial man at heart. That his anger could explode like this did not surprise me yet it still left me quailing a little internally. We've been played and I don't even know by who, choked Joffrey. His stick hit the ground as he raised his hands to Laner's waist and clung to him like a storm raged around him. Lena and I watched, not daring to interrupt the scene in front of us. It wasn't the Dornish, he continued after a moment, Laner stroking circles on his back. I know it wasn't the Dornish. Someone is playing us like a fucking fiddle and I have no clue who. He pulled back, wobbling a little, and gave Laner a broken look. My heart clenched at the distress I saw there. I failed to find a poisoned bottle of wine even after I'd drunk some of it. I failed to stop Otto from dying and triggering a war with Dorn. Everything might have been over today and I could do nothing, he wailed. How am I supposed to protect you if I can't even prevent an obvious plot like this? Laner pulled him close again and mumbled reassuring words to him. We were played, Joffrey said, tone miserable. 
This war cannot be stopped now. You will be on the front lines and I cannot even lift a sword to defend you. Yet you can defend my wife and children, Joff. You will have stay with them here and look after them for me, Laner mumbled. You know what we're all like without you. Witless idiots chasing smoke. I wanted to protest my exclusion once more but was prevented from ranting by Lena's arms clenching tightly around me. Rainey's was lost due to luck and sloppiness on her part, murmured Lena, sensing why I was so distressed. You may be assured we will not fall prey to arrogance. I order it. You are both to ensure you come back to me. Laner's chuckle was my answer, at least until Joffrey reiterated the order to his lover, sounding like he was on the verge of some kind of breakdown. I suppose this means you cannot avoid mother's armor fittings anymore, Lena, Laner said, trying to lighten the mood. I cannot contain myself in excitement. Her deadpan tone sent me into fits of almost hysterical giggles which set her sulking. I detest the thought of flying whilst encased in metal. It's not too bad, Lena. You'll need to get used to it anyway if you think mother will allow you to set even a toe in Dorne without it. Besides, mother has been flying in armor for years. His eyes were bright but he was worried. We'd both flown in, well, the fall of Gulltown was not war. Not in the way Dorne would be. Gulltown had been open to its besiegers. Our presence had been surplus to requirements, mere bonuses that had saved lives rather than the cause itself. Yet we'd both taken lives. Neither of us had enjoyed it. Laner would be forced to deploy his dragon in battles and sieges, to kill with sea smoke in a way he never had before. If he hesitated, if he let on how much the thought disturbed him, he would be labeled a craven. We need a strategy to take to the War Council, I said finally. Otherwise they'll use Otto's as a foundation. What's wrong with it? asked Lena, resting her hands on my belly. I admit I am not all that martially minded but surely he wouldn't have created a plan that would fail. He wanted the Reach armies and Stormlanders taking point, I said, ignoring the scoff that elicited from Joffrey. Undulls. It would be a bloodbath. Marcher lords especially are very unreasonable when it comes to the Dornish. Centuries of raiding will do that, muttered my spymaster. He wanted, I said, ignoring him. The dragons to burn every castle from here to Sunspear to prevent lengthy sieges and he wanted land for the Reach and the Stormlands after the war was done. I dread to think at the atrocities they would commit on innocent people should they be allowed their shot at glory. So we need lords without bad blood with the Dornish leading the charge, mused Laner. River men, perhaps Vale men. Might we call the Falcons to negotiate the Red Mountains? I blinked at that suggestion. It had no crossed my mind. I had been of the mind to build on the strategy Dayron the young dragon had used to conquer Dorne in the canon timeline. Something about goat paths and Alan Valerion. Or were the goat paths Rob Stark? Have them scout for the main invasion force through the Boneway and Prince's Pass. He elaborated. It would do much to counter the Dornish strategy of bleeding our men slowly through ambushes and skirmishes. Plus it will demonstrate Renera has military sense even if she is not physically present. Everyone knows the Falcons are hers even if they are nominally there to control the mountain clans, Joffrey said. Though if we pull too many from the Vale the clans will respond. I closed my eyes and let Lena cradle me, thoughts of Jane and Helena, left virtually undefended against those murderous rapists playing before my mind's eye. If too many men left the Vale seeking glory, the Falcons may be the only thing to prevent a resurgence of the mountain clans and their raiding. Invading Dorne was such a bad idea. Too much danger, too much to lose, not enough reward to justify it. Hmm, if we can break Planky Town we could control the green blood. We'd break Dorne in half, shatter their united front. I cracked open an eye as memories of the young dragon strategy finally formed and I giggled without meaning to. All three of them peered at me. Alan came up with that same plan, I told Laner and he promptly flushed a deep red. You can tell who you both learnt your trade from. Alan? But he is a babe. I stiffened in Lena's arms. I had never gotten to tell her that night. I had been too tired and after it never seemed to be a good time. A future thing, said Laner, still red. Perhaps I should be told about that, she said dryly in response. I will give you the details later, Joffrey was quick to interrupt even as Laner opened his mouth to tell her everything. She nodded in agreement and let the matter lie. I will see if I can't come up with some way to subdue Dorne. It will do much for our cause if I am seen as the warrior prince to your good queen, said Laner, blushing when Joffrey directed a look of pride at him. I smiled, to be fair to Joffrey, that was something he'd likely learnt by spending time in his proximity. And what would my princess have me do? I can focus on battle, 
I have acquired texts detailing the Third Giskari War, asked Lena, sounding almost eager. At my baffled look, she blushed a little and I was reminded of Laner's enthusiasm regarding ETI. The Third Giskari War saw the most dragons downed during the fighting. Nearly more were brought down than the other four put together. Mother and I can use it to develop techniques against siege weaponry to avoid such fates. I decided a history lesson would too much for tonight. If Lena were anything like Laner, I'd be getting one soon enough. Your princess would have you take her to bed and lie with her whilst she passes out for the rest of the day, I grumbled, causing her to laugh. But figuring out how to ensure you all return to me alive is your highest priority. She smiled. Far be it for me to deny my princess's commands, she purred and it was a testament to how uncomfortable I was that the voice and accompanying throaty rumble did precisely nothing for me. Then she pouted. It's a shame though. I really thought I was onto something with the hatching process. Is this why you tore Dragonstone's library apart looking for an unedited copy of Septon Barth's work? I asked, ignoring Laner's snickering. Because I had to field that particular complaint. The Castellan was most displeased with the mess you left. Lena is like that when she gets stuck on a topic. Our maester once had to chase her halfway across the castle after she looted a good amount of his maps to chart an optimal air route to Bravos. Her leg shot out and kicked at his knees in response to his teasing and he danced backwards, grinning widely. Don't start this war, Laner, you can't win, she warned. I know far more about you than you do about me. Yes but Joffrey already knows all that. Renera, on the other hand, has yet to learn about your belief cats were female dogs until long after you rode Vagar. Or Dash, I was gently pushed aside as she wriggled around me and darted after her brother. His laugh became a screech as she jammed her fingers into his side, sending him flailing sideways in a vain attempt to escape. I laughed at the sibling's antics before pain spasmed through my stomach and I was forced to lean over and groan as the pangs and cramps I had been ignoring all day made themselves known in a way that brought tears to my eyes. Laner was at my side in an instant, his eyes wide and concerned as I breathed through the pain. Then I tensed as I felt warm liquid trickle down my leg and my face burned with the humiliation of wetting myself in front of my husband and my lover. What's wrong? He asked quietly. I. I had a bit of an accident, I admitted in a whisper, cheeks burning. I may need some help cleaning myself up. His eyes widened as he nodded, going to stand to call a maid when Lena leant past him, evidently having seen the small puddle that must no doubt be forming. I wanted to melt into the floor, wanted the earth to swallow me whole that she should see it. Blockhead. Call Alanis. Her waters have broken. Oh. Renera was not beautiful like this. She was not beautiful drenched in sweat and tears with her braid a mess, sending her hair frizzing about her face. She was not beautiful, crouched on all fours, screaming and sobbing in pain, begging for someone to make it all stop. Yet she could not have loved her more in that moment. She curled her hands down her bare sides and kneaded at her back and sides, trying desperately to relieve some of the pain the woman she loved was feeling. It had been easier a few hours earlier, before the contractions had started in truth. Seven help me, gods help me, sobbed Renera and she wanted nothing more to cradle her until it was all better. Her lover's pain burned at her, pulled at her heart, in a way she could barely stand. Breath with me, Renera. It'll all be fine. You were made for this. You just need to breath, she murmured, bringing a hand over her hair and pushing it back from her face. Renera's eyes flickered close for a brief moment and then she nodded with a grimace, attempting to follow the breathing that she laid out for her. They were supposed to teach her this in confinement. Yet the babes had come early. Too early, she feared. Renera was still over a week away from taking her chamber. The baby is close to crowning, get her to do several smaller pushes, ordered Alanis from her position at the other end of the bed. Renera must have heard her because she gave a choked sob before wailing in pain. It's too much. It's too much. I can't. No, she could not let her go down that path. She had to stop her, she had experienced this. It's fine. Breathe with me. We'll breathe together, then you push when I say. Her breath stuttered when Renera's eyes met hers, a haze of pain in them. Yet also trust. Complete and utter trust. She would not betray that trust, not again. The urge to drop a kiss to her brow rose strong inside her and she quashed it, she could not do that in front of the midwives. With me, she murmured into those trusting eyes. Ready? The first babe came into the world ten minutes later, a loud wail announcing their presence. A girl, called Alanis, handing her off to a waiting midwife. 
She could not watch for long, Renera had yet more work. She knew it too, had realized it, because she was crying and begging once more. Invoking the names of gods that Lena had never heard of to spare her, to make it all end. Swearing in a manner she would not have expected from a highborn woman, swearing in a way that turned her pink despite the circumstances. You can do this, Renera, you can. Are you going to prove Alicent right? That you will fail here? Will you let the one who sought to harm your babes win? From the clenched jaw she received in turn, her comments had hit the mark as she braced once more, trying to recapture the rhythm they had established. Alanis gave her a nod of respect. The babes coming so soon had been a surprise. Rhea was not here, mother was not here. Only she was here. Her hands kneaded at her back once more as Renera wailed and pushed. You are doing so well, she told her, as the babe already born was attended to. Gods, she was so small. Luceris had been a giant compared to this babe and yet she struggled against the midwife that was holding her, screaming up a storm. A little more. A few more pushes. You will have two babes then. Little Alyssa is already here. Her sister or brother should join her soon. She doubted Renera was actually listening to what she said now yet the sound of her voice brought those pained eyes back to her and her lover pushed her forehead into her midsection, bringing her hands forward, under her skirts, to clench at her thighs. It drew a hiss of pain from her and she was certain that she would draw blood before the end. She would bear it. If it scarred her, she would bear the scars as well. She owed her that much. She had borne pain from someone she loved before. She could bear yet more from Renera. Ah, shit, muttered Alanis and her eyes found the midwife in horror. Alanis, as a general rule, tried not to swear. Especially not in front of a woman already given to panic in the throes of a birth. Get her to push, Lena, now. She did, coaxing action from the princess with a calm she did not feel. When the second babe crowned once more, Renera screamed louder than any time before, twisting her nails deeper into her flesh. Then she vomited into her lap. Bile rose to her throat yet Renera kept her pinned in position, the tearing feeling in her thighs growing worse. What had happened? There was no cry from the new babe and her heart flew into her throat. There was no cry, no sound. Below her, Renera seemed not to have realized as her sobbing continued with no change in pitch or rhythm. Alanis turned away from them, hiding the child from view but Lena saw. It was even smaller than the first. Was it dead? Had Renera struggled so hard, survived so much, only to lose one of her babes before they even lived? Then a reedy wail split the air and her sigh of relief must have been audible even to Alanis and her compatriots. Another girl, said Alanis after a moment. The new babe was quickly weighed and examined then placed in a waiting tank. She fought the worry in her gut. Then the midwives finally noticed the position she was in. They were swift after that. They pried Renera from her, and yes she had drawn blood, allowing her to get free. Then she was sent from the room to change whilst they stitched the damage. She felt ill at that. She had needed no stitches afterwards. She swallowed back bile as she remembered how scared she'd been, how terrified birth made Renera. If anything happened now, could she forgive herself? Laner and her mother met her halfway down the corridor. What a sight she must have been, covered in vomit and her own blood. Exhaustion hit her as if she had run a footrace and she sagged into the wall. Girls, she told her brother and his face lit up. Girls, he repeated at volume, like some kind of mimic bird. Could she forgive him if Renera died? What's wrong? asked mother. Laner paused, his glee flickering into worry. You look grim. One of them, they put one of them in the tank. She was so, so small and she did not cry until a while after the birth. Alanis says Renera needs stitches, she babbled, worry making her nearly incoherent. Laner looked to their mother like a lost puppy and she sighed, aggrieved. She could not forgive him if Renera died, she decided. At her look, mother took Laner by the arm and sent him off to see the new babes and his wife. Then her own arm was taken and she was marched to her rooms and stripped. A damp washcloth was pushed into her hands and she cleaned herself the best she could. Renera had torn her legs open and the cleaning renewed the dribbles of blood, prompting mother take cloth from her and press it to them. She will be fine. More women than not need stitching back up after birth, mother said, as she moved the cloth to the basin and back. The seven know I needed it with you and your brother. I did not, she mumbled and her mother chuckled. Your pregnancy was about as good as they go, she was told. There was a tone she did not recognize in her voice when she spoke again. 
it will take Renera longer to recover. She will need time and rest. Renera was not the type to rest for long unless she was feeling sorry for herself. She hated her like that, her black moods that could bring anger or self-recrimination. Did you see much of the babes? Her mother's voice was anxious and she smiled despite herself. No. But what I did see, they were so small. Much smaller than Lucerys, she mused and her mother snorted in amusement once more. Twins are small. Twins that come early smaller still. Come, her mother stood, depositing the bloody washcloth in the basin. Let's get you dressed. Then we shall go and see your new nieces. If you like this content, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you later, bye bye.